there have been many things that we've learned during COVID about ourselves and about the world around us. But one of the things that I think has become pretty clear is that popular news media, especially print or web-based, has become really progressive in how they're displaying data and other information. Uh, so many sites have interactivity built into them, whether it's 538.com and the New York Times or our local newspaper, the Ann Arbor News.com. All of their stories about COVID and so many other things have interactivity built into them. Yet, here I am, a scientist who's supposed to be at the cutting edge of data and analysis and whatnot. Uh, I'm stuck with a PDF <laughs> or a static web page. Why can't we have interactivity in our science when we're telling stories about things that are far more exciting than the day-to-day -day variation in COVID or, or rates by county? Um, why can't I have that type of interactivity in my displays of data? Well, we can. <laughs> and thankfully today, I have someone from my lab, Sarah Lucas, uh, to show us how we can build interactivity into our visuals. So today I have with me Dr. Sarah Lucas, who's a postdoc in my lab at the University of Michigan. A few weeks ago at our lab meeting, uh, Sarah gave us a presentation on using a package called Plotly for building interactivity into data visuals. And I thought this would be really cool for presenting in here on YouTube with Code Club. Thank you, Sarah, for your willingness to come on to this. I've never had a guest before, uh, so this is a bit of an experiment, but um, I'm sure we'll I'm sure we'll figure things out. So thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Plotly, as I understand it, allows us to build a um, HTML-based visual that we can interact with, and perhaps you've seen these types of visuals. Um, I know I've seen these like on the um, you know various interactives for COVID data over the past year that I can kind of hover my mouse over a specific day, um, and then that will kind of make that bar or that point on a line kind of uh, a little bit more bold and more prominent so I can see it, right? So you can begin to think perhaps we could do that with the ordination we've been looking at. So I have the code that I shared with Sarah saying, hey, Sarah, we've got this ordination that we've built as a TIFF, but we'd like to incorporate the um, interactivity. And so if you would also like to get a copy of this code, please be sure to check down below in the description. I've got a link for a blog post for today's episode and all the episodes where you can find the code we're starting with. Also, uh, this is ultimately hopefully going to produce a HTML-based visual, and I'll do my best to make sure that that visual in all its interactive glory winds up in the blog post as well. Just so we are all on the same page with what the current code generates, let me go ahead and uh, run this. And it's a little bit different than some of the other ones we've been wor working with. We have our uh, legend. Uh, we don't have a title on this, but that, no worries. It's, it's a pretty generic ordination plot. And one of the things that I saw that Sarah was able to accomplish with Plotly was that if, if you can imagine my cursor here lighting up or sitting over this blue point, and then it opens up a dialog window, or it's called a tooltip, I think, which then tells you more information about that point. And one of the things that I know is really exciting to people about visualization is where they can look at kind of more personalized data. Um, you know, we don't, this is patient health information protected data. So I wouldn't want this to pop up and be like, oh, that's, you know, Samantha Jones. <laughs> um, we, we don't want that type of information, but is this a point from a man or a woman? Uh, what's the disease status of this person? Um, you know, what strain of C. difficile did we see in them? All sorts of different information that we could layer on top of other information than like say disease status. So I think that's all, um, that, that's one of the things that I see as potential value with Plotly. So enough of me talking about what I want to see or would hope for, uh, let's see if Sarah can't help me figure out how to do this. So Sarah, what should we do first to get going and generating a Plotly diagram here? Well, Pat, one of the um, best things I think Plotly can offer to someone just um, beginning to use this package is their um, uh, function, um, Plotly function called ggplotly. And um, that enables us to take any of our ggplot objects or most of our ggplot objects and immediately add interactivity um, just by taking the plot object from ggplot and using it as an argument in the ggplotly function. So um, let's go to the bottom of the plot um, or bottom of the ggplot code. Okay. Well, sorry. Um, first, we want to uh, assign our, our ggplot object to a variable. Um, and we're going to call that variable p. Cool. Awesome. 
Um, and next, we want to use p in the ggplotly function. So down below the ggplot code, um, we're going to call our new plot p1 and um, use the assignment arrow. Yep. Um, and then, oh, I forgot. Did we load in the Plotly package? <laughs> I don't think so, but that wouldn't be the first time I forgot to load a package here. It's something so. I forget to do all the time, too. <laughs> so is it it's Plotly? Yep, it's, it's okay. library Plotly. And so people might need to install Plotly if they don't already have it installed. But again, if you can install Tidyverse, you can get Plotly. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, so down below, um, type ggplotly. Right. Uh, and it's one word, or is there an underscore anywhere? Or is that? It is one word. Okay. Um, and then we will use our ggplot as the first argument in ggplotly, followed by a comma. Um, and let's see. Right away, I think we uh, we can just leave it at that and see what happens. And then do I call p1? Yep. Um, and just type p1. I'm excited to see this. <laughs> so. Ah, so it looks a little different. Yeah, one of the best things I think is that we can take work that we've already done. So, so a lot of the work we do in the Schloss Lab, we use ggplot for. Um, and if we want to add inter interactivity to that, we can do it very quickly with ggplotly. Um, so let's look at a couple of the uh, components of this plot. Cool. So I noticed like if I hover over the points, it's showing me axis one, axis two, information about the disease status. Um, that's very slick. And so I can imagine we can customize what's presented in the tooltip. That's what we call hover info, um, the, the info that pops up. And the ggplotly function is taking that information directly from the layers in our ggplot object. Cool. And one of the things I noticed when I come over to my legend is that I don't get a pop up, but I get like a, a pointer when I hover over uh, the elements in my legend. What happens if I click? Well, that's because the legend is also interactive. And so um, one of, I think, the uh, best functions for really highly dimensional data that we work with in the microbiome research world is um, that you can click on each component of that legend and toggle on or off the data in the plot. So if you click on that, it, it will toggle on and off the non diarrheal control. Um, so it allows you to look at different um, parts of your data uh, together. Very slick. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And then I imagine these tools across the top. Um, so it looks like I can download this plot as a PNG. I could zoom. Uh, not sure. Do you know how to zoom if I have that zoom? You can either click the plus or minus button, but you can also, um, if you ever want to reset your plot, you can just click the home um, button at the top of the plot. Uh, and another way that you can um, uh, explore really highly dimensional data is just by grabbing the plot and drawing a box around the part of the plot that you want to look at. So, and all of this interactivity is customizable in the ggplotly function um, or plotly plots. So nice. say you wanted to zoom in on some uh, points of interest, that would be how you do it. That's really cool. Can you maybe show us how we could customize what's coming up in the hover? Absolutely, because right now it's not that informative. <laughs> um, but uh, we can definitely uh, add more information. And um, we can. there are a couple ways to do this um, using ggplotly or um, creating a plotly plot. Um, but one way I like to do it is to designate what I want in my hover info um, using a tooltip in the ggplotly function. And um, we are basically telling ggplotly where to grab the information from in our original plot to show in the hover info. Um, and so first, we need to designate in our ggplot um, object that information. And we can do that using the text variable in our um, mapping. <laughs> Um, in our list of mapping variables. And I like to do this in the uh, ggplot layer that um, I'm most interested in having that information show up on. So that would be our points. Um, so if we go to our geome point uh, uh, um, part of our ggplot and we um, begin with typing our aesthetics, our mapping aesthetics, uh, we can type text equals 
And then we're going to use a um, function called paste. Uh, and that's just so we can um, really customize the information that uh, the, the text information that um, we see in our hover info. Uh, so I, I thought maybe we would look at sample ID, um, disease state, uh, and maybe add some patient information like subject age. Cool. Um, so I guess we need it to be one long string then. So we could do like sample ID. Um, I always forget, I don't know about you, but I always forget my column names, especially when it's not like my data. So age is lowercase. So if we do sample ID, age, what was the other one that you thought would be good? Oh, disease stat. Disease stat. And so we probably want, do we want maybe like line breaks in between them? I think that might be uh, good for readability. And then maybe we could do like age colon like that. And then, yeah, that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. And so people that are interested in learning more about paste, um, another tool we've been learning at our lab meetings is a, a cool function called glue. Uh, and I think the next episode, I'll actually be doing a demo of glue. So remember what this looks like and kind of how difficult it is to keep track of your quotes and commas and delimiters and everything because glue is gonna make things nice, but let's not add too many things all at once. So it's giving me a warning. I know people always get worried about warnings. Is that something we need to worry about? No, ggplot is just telling you that it's ignoring this um, aesthetics uh, piece of information um, because it's not gonna make use of it, but the ggplotly function is. Um, and then down below in our ggplotly function, we need to tell it to use the text aesthetic um, as our hover info. So if you follow the P with a comma, we can add something called a tooltip. Um, and we want to have that equal to text in quotations. Text in quotes, okay. Yep, and um, let's see what it looks like. So it looks the same, but let's see what the hover looks like. Ooh, slick. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. It's very customizable. Yeah, I like that. And so something that I notice, so we're not going to do everything for people. I think this there's a number of things that hopefully this gets people's imagination going. A couple of things we can maybe think about changing is like here, like diarrheal control is um, all one word. Perhaps you could think about make people at home could think about making a, a mutate line to better format um, the disease status for something that might come up in a tooltip like this. Um, also, perhaps there might be other information you want to put in here. So perhaps someone, um, you know, I think I would be interested in the sample ID because, you know, maybe I want to know what are the samples up here versus down here that are kind of at the furthest extremes because I want to know, like, I don't know, what's what's different between those samples. Um, and so I would want to know, like, what is the subject ID so I can go back to that sample. But, but maybe you, whoever's doing this analysis, doesn't care. Uh, but you might think about other information you might want to put in here, like the person's sex or, you know, have they been on antibiotics lately or things like that. So that's really cool. That's really cool. So one thing that I see that it just annoys me, these little things always bug me, is that if you look at right below the A and the age, there's a space, <laughs> right? And so these are, this is kind of my obsessive compulsive problems. But that is a problem with paste function because the delimiter in paste, when it you paste all this together, it puts in spaces. And so we don't see those spaces, but I often will use like paste zero because paste zero then doesn't use a delimiter. But again, sorry, this is really nothing about Plotly. It's more about Pat and his OCD issues. But now if we look at this, yeah, then it lines up. Oh, I much better. <laughs> <laughs> so I would do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is really cool. And I would love to be able to, you know, someday put this into a paper, but until then, I uh, might just have to settle for a really cool blog post, or maybe you could figure out how to post HTML as a supplemental file. But um, how how would we save this as an HTML? So you know the the people watching this video or anyone else could interact with it like like we've been able to interact with it. Yeah. So um, one of the ways that we can save our new plot um, with its interactivity intact is by using a package called HTML widgets. So let's load that up above. Widgets. Widgets. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. And HTML widgets has a function um, called save widget. 
um, and widget is capitalized. Yep. And if we use our new plot, our interactive plot as the first argument, um, we can follow it up with what we want to name our plot. I assume we want the HTML file extension there? Correct. Okay. Yep. And then finally, we have two other arguments to put place there. Um, Self-contained equals false. Okay. And libdir equals lib. In quotation. Yeah. Let's give this a run. So I see I now have a Schubert interactive.html file. Let's fire that up. Nice. And of course, there's so many ways that we could probably style this by learning more about Plotly um, to make points bigger or smaller or colors or manipulating the axes, right? Correct. Yeah, there's so much you can do. What's what's one of your favorite things or what, what's something easy that you think we could add to this to make the plot look a little bit better? Uh, maybe we should add a title. That'd be awesome. So um, what we would do is we would use um, the, the chaining command um, so that's one of the great things about uh, the ggplotly function is you can use the chaining command from the tidyverse package uh, to add arguments um, to your plot. So uh, if you add that to the end of our ggplotly function. Okay. So pipe. Oh, pipe. Okay. Um, and uh, follow that up with a new line. Yep. And add layout. Yep, followed by parentheses. And then inside layout, all we do is we designate title equals and the name that we want to name our plot. Cool. So we could say, <laughs> I can never think of good titles. Um, Check out my awesome interactive plot. <laughs> you can go back to other episodes to figure out what I think we should probably actually name these things. <laughs> This this will work for a placeholder. So that's good. I guess I'll run that and then save widget. Awesome. So we've got a title. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have a title. Yeah. So right. it just depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, many people might want to change the title in ggplot um, and then just use the ggplotly function to add interactivity. Um, or you can add it uh, down here. So lots of options. So this is awesome, Sarah. Um, so this is taking a ggplot figure that we've already made and we've perhaps spent a lot of time generating. Um, is there more power perhaps in building a plot directly within ggplotly? I think uh, definitely there is um, a lot of ability to customize what your plot looks like when you're building um, a plot using Plotly from scratch. Uh, however, if you're very comfortable um, coding using ggplot, then um, the ggplotly function uh, really allows you to jump right in. Um, but let's try and build a plot from scratch using the Plotly um, uh, library of functions. That'd be awesome. Yeah, let's give that a shot. So we can kind of compare and contrast what the syntax looks like. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, let's call it plotly plot. Okay. And the function that plotly uses to build your base plot is plotly, so plot underscore ly. Um, and then let's open parentheses and designate our data. And we do that with um, just writing data. Um, or you can just say what it is, okay. uh, data equals. Um, and then in the Plotly function, um, the uh, way you designate the, the different variables is a little bit different. Um, so a comma and then um, x equals. And then we want to have the tilde okay. um, followed by the variable of interest for x. It's so like axis 1. Mm -hmm. And we can do the same thing for the y variable. OK, so axis 2. OK. Um, and then uh, say we want to um, match uh, kind of the plot that we previously made, we can also designate color um, to a variable uh, using the same, the tilde, yep, also with the tilde. Um, and then we can write in the Plotly function, we can um, say what we want those colors to be. Uh, and we would do that um, instead of saying color, which is used to designate the variable, we would use um, colors. Okay. Yep. Um, and then I think we chose uh, blue, red, and gray. Okay. And you'll notice I had to change up the order a little bit 
um, from our, our ggplot, but I hope this will this will work. All right, um, and then finally, we can also designate what we want our hover text to say right in this initial function. Um, and uh, we do that um, also using the paste function, but we can use paste zero, I think, if, if you would like. <laughs> Um, but we'll start with the same variable um, text okay. or the, um, the same option text uh, and then a, a tilde just like we use for the other options um, and then uh, paste. Um, and if we open up some parentheses, we can um, dictate exactly how we want it to look. Um, and the way that we would assign a line break here is by using... Is it like HTML? So we've seen that in other episodes, people might remember, because I'll use ggtext to, um, when I was putting HTML and CSS for colors in the, in the title before, to make line breaks within the HTML, we use that, that break. So would that be like, so we'd do like sample ID. Let me see if I can, <laughs> BR, and then um, I guess BR and uh, age, and then age and disease stat. I guess we need another break, right? Another break, yeah. And then disease stat. Okay. That's it. Great. So give this a run. And so then I run plotly plot. Uh, and yeah, see what it looks like. Cool. So the plot looks similar, but a bit different. Um, and I'm sure there's all sorts of things we can do to stylize the plotly visual here. Um, like we saw with kind of changing the title, we can probably change the axis labels, no doubt the placement of the axes. So instead of going through the middle, kind of being on the edges, um, we see with the tooltip pop-up that we've got the X and Y coordinate, as well as the disease status across the top, um, along with the information we wanted in there. Um, this is not meant to be a tutorial to tell people, you know, exactly everything they need to know about running Plotly, uh, but to get you excited about uh, visualizing your data in an, an interactive way. One thing that always bugs me, and I know it always bugs uh, learners, are seeing these red messages like we have in the console. So Sarah, do you have ideas on, um, I th it seems like Plotly is pretty smart and that it's figuring out that this is a scatter plot. Do you know what we can do to perhaps clean these up so we don't see these scary red messages? Yeah, it's nice that Plotly gives us messages um, telling us what it's doing with our data. Um, and uh, right here, it's talking about um, two different uh, things that we can customize um, or, or designate in our function. Um, one is the plot type, uh, and it's chosen a scatter plot. Um, and then uh, one is um, the, the mode of the plot, and uh, it has set that to markers. Um, but we can write that right in the Plotly function um, just to be really clear about what we want our plot to look like. Uh, and that is using um, type and mode. Uh, so let's set our plot type to scatter. And mode. our plot mode to markers. Okay, so we'll give that a run. Plot we plot. Cool. So we don't get any warning messages. <laughs> it's not angry at us. And again, we get this nice visual. So it's really cool that we can build a plotly plot from scratch. I suspect, or in my experience, when there are packages that allow you to take an existing visual and perhaps kind of re-render it within their environment, uh, you lose a little bit of power. Um, and but at the same time. Uh, you can kind of, people can see, I think the syntax here is quite a bit different than what we've seen with ggplot. So I think, I think that power is being able to generate a plot in ggplot using all those great plotting skills we develop and then bringing it straight into Plotly. Uh, but I think it would be pretty cool also uh, to learn more about Plotly to build visuals uh, directly. One thing I want to point out to people that I notice is this tilde notation might be a little bit new to people. Um, in a lot of what's called base R uh, functions, you'll see that tilde used to used in place of the words uh, explained by axis one. So we're plotting the data explained by axis one, or Y explained by axis two, color explained by disease stat. Um, it's called I think it's called formula notation, but a slight different way that you might see in other R packages. So. Very cool. 
thanks, Sarah, for sharing this with us. And it certainly got me interested in learning more about interactivity and other things we can do with Plotly. Um, I think I've seen enough of Plotly out there in the wild on the web uh, to know that it's a really powerful tool that has all the built-in or standard tools for building plots, but probably other things that people would be interested in, like dendrograms and working with maps and all sorts of really cool things. So thanks for sharing this with us. Um, are there resources that you would recommend that you found most useful as you've been learning about Plotly? Yeah, um, so uh, the creators of Plotly, um, or this R graphics library, uh, have produced really, really helpful documentation with examples, and, and we'll leave a link to that um, down below. Uh, but that would be my first stop to learn uh, more about customizing my Plotly plot. And I suspect that if, if everything is based on HTML and JavaScript and CSS and Plotly, then everything's probably able to be manipulated. So that, that's pretty slick. Cool. Well, I will be sure to put this visual um, or the one that we built before into the blog notes as well so people can interact with it and play with the data themselves. So thanks a lot, Sarah, for your willingness to come on and share your expertise with Plotly with, with people watching today. So thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, I really hope that you found that tutorial from Sarah helpful in thinking about how we can add interactivity to our visuals. I really think we need to get beyond the PDF, um, beyond the printed page, and get into 2021 where we have HTML, web pages, interactivity. I mean, if, if the local newspaper can do it that's barely hanging on, uh, why can't we do it with our research labs and describing our research with data that's far more complex and interesting than what the local news is looking at? Anyway, enough of the ranting. Um, but again, I think this is also useful in our kind of ongoing discussion of how can we put more information into our visuals while at the same time not overdoing it and detracting from the overall story. Um, something that Sarah and I were talking about uh, earlier was that just because you make a plot interactive, that doesn't make the plot good. <laughs> you can have interactive plots that still look horrible and that don't communicate a useful story. So. Above all, make sure your plot is telling something important. Um, then add the interactivity on top of that to kind of add extra flavor to it. Um, you know, no amount of interactivity is gonna take a bad plot and make it good. Uh, like I said earlier, it'd be great if you played around with those tool tips, play around with your own data. Uh, you know, for the tool tips for this ordination, could you put in uh, the patient's sex or whether or not they've been on antibiotics recently? Uh, see what other type of information you can add to the plot. Uh, see about doing this with your own data. Uh, go ahead and explore the Plotly package and see how you might go about making a line plot or other types of visuals that might work well with your data. Uh, perhaps if we get enough people doing this, who knows, we could change science. Who knows, I doubt it, <laughs> but, but we can try. Keep practicing with this material. Uh, let me know if you like this format. I've never had a guest on before, so kudos for Sarah for um, taking the plunge with me and, and seeing how this would work out. I think it was fun. I think I learned something new and hopefully you did as well. Please share this with your friend, share this with your PI, um, and keep practicing with the materials. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.